good morning. Uh, I'm Will Goldsmith. I'm a historian and I am a researcher for the Sanford School of Public Policy's 50th anniversary uh, research project. And as part of this uh, 50th anniversary, we're doing a series of interviews with founders and um, important people in the history of the Sanford School. And our guest today is William Asher. Um, professor Asher is currently the Donald C. McKenna Professor of Government and Economics at Claremont McKenna College. But for about 16 years, you were here at Duke during a very formative period. You were a very crucial figure in Duke's transition from a university that was very uh, renowned nationally um, into one that is now much more an international uh, institution. Co-founded what is now the Duke Center for International Development, and you served as the director of the Sanford Institute, as it was then called, from 1994 to 1997 during an important moment in its transition. So by the time you left Duke, uh, Duke and the Sanford School were well on their way to, to globalizing both in their outlook, but also in the, the student bodies and, and the people that were represented here. And so while I'm sure you wouldn't take all the credit for that, it's still quite a legacy. And so hopefully we can revisit some of these chapters during your career here at Duke. Now I wanted to just start out by getting an understanding of your interest in international development and policy sciences generally. How did you come to study these things and, and take the sort of outlook that you took through political science and policy science? Mm -hmm. Well, I was a graduate student at Yale University. Um, had the great fortune of working with Harold D. Laswell, who was the founder of the policy sciences movement. And there was always an international component to the policy sciences movement, after all, the idea of globalization really is not new. Mm -hmm. People talk about it as being a very new phenomenon, but it isn't. And I simply fell in love with the idea of looking at other countries, trying to see the commonalities and differences, and found that if I learned Spanish, which is a language I hadn't studied before, that I can get a whole bunch of countries by doing work in Latin America. <laughs> So I did dissertation research in Argentina and Chile, and uh, later on started doing work in Southeast Asia and South Asia. But it was pretty clear that it was enormously exciting to do work on other countries, particularly developing countries, because the stakes are so much higher. The United States generally does pretty well. We don't grow at 10% a year. Uh, we generally grow a little bit. Our politics, until fairly recently, were pretty stable. But with developing countries, the policies could make or break a country. Mm -hmm. And I found that absolutely fascinating. And so I've been working on that ever since uh, graduate school. And then when I came to Duke, and I have to say that I take even less credit than you might think about internationalizing it. Because when I arrived here, uh, to my delight, Malcolm Gillis was hired the same year, and Sudhir Shetty, who's now at the World Bank, in fact, I'm going to be seeing him tomorrow afternoon at the World Bank, came at the same time. And so the leaders of the Sanford Institute at the time, uh, Phil Cook, Bruce Cunahome, were mainly the leaders, had decided to internationalize uh, the Sanford Institute. And it became quite clear that this was a mandate that we should fulfill and we're delighted to fulfill. So uh, Malcolm and I started the center. And at that time, there was a really open policy in terms of centers within the Sanford Institute. If anybody had the resources and the the energy to set up a center, one could do that. And if that no longer became as interesting or as exciting, the center would then disappear. Hmm. So it was 1985 that Malcolm and I co-founded the, what was then the Center for International Development Research. Since we had no assets, we called it that fancy title with research in it. <laughs> Uh, in the hope that we could do more with it. You came to Duke in 1984. You had been working for about 10 years at Johns Hopkins in their political science department. 
what drew you to Duke, and how did they recruit you here, uh, and what was your interest in coming from a traditional uh, academic unit, a political science department, into something um, that was a little more freeform in, in, in terms of, of policy science, public policy? Well, since graduate school, uh, I was enamored with the idea of doing interdisciplinary, problem-oriented policy sciences. And that's the label for this movement that is still going very strong. Uh, the philosophy being that if you're looking at real-world problems, only an idiot would just look at the political aspects or only look at the economic aspects, et cetera. And the Sanford Institute seemed to do that. Uh, besides the Kennedy School at Harvard, the Sanford Institute was one of the very few places that actually was interdisciplinary. And when you think about the faculty there, Bruce Cunahome, PhD in history from Duke, uh, Phil Cook, economist from Berkeley, uh, a number of other people in philosophy, political science, really broad range of fields, to me, that was nirvana, and that, that commitment. Plus, it became clear that the faculty at the Sanford Institute really cared about teaching. Hmm. And that, that was quite distinctive. Uh, most research universities, as you know, will favor the, their own research on the faculty level and maybe their graduate students. But the commitment to both the undergraduates and to the master's students, the MPP students here, was so obvious. And I really thought that was wonderful. And that was actually one reason why it took a while to set up a PhD program in mm -hmm. public policy. Because people like uh, Bruce Cunahome and Phil Cook did not want to beggar the undergraduate major and the master's program. Mm -hmm. They felt they needed to wait till they had the resources to devote uh, enough resources to all three, including the PhD program. Now, when you set up the Center for International Development Research with Malcolm Gillis, was that something that came about organically? Is that something that you, when you were first hired, you knew you wanted to set up something like that? Or, or how did that come about? I think it was obvious that if we created some sort of entity, we could be open to whatever opportunities might occur. Originally, the idea was to see whether we could gin up some research together. Uh, Sudhir Shetty, for example, uh, was at that time a specialist in South Asia. Right now, I think he's heading one of the World Bank's major units uh, throughout East Asia. Um, Malcolm had done a lot of work in Southeast Asia. He was one of the gurus on tax reform. He had worked in Colombia and other Latin American countries. Uh, my work was in Latin America at, at that time. And we thought we would just be open to see whether we could collaborate and to see whether other people at, at Duke would be willing to play with us. Hmm. Was that an experiment at that time? That You, you didn't know if there would be uh, folks to, to play with you, as you say? Duke was really open to collaboration. So Gary Jereffi was somebody that I was working with. Uh, I had good friends at UNC, Lars Schultz. Uh, so it, it was not at all a risk to try to set up a center and see what kinds of resources we could create. We stole some furniture from other places, we snagged a big room that had been unoccupied and set that up as, as a center just to see what would happen. Uh, and what happened was that we ended up establishing this mid-career program, which at the time was called the Program in International Development Policy, uh, PIDP, now for some reason called the MIDP. And we thought that if we set up this mid-career program, we would be able to bring in people from developing countries, uh, as well as from foreign assistance agencies, to work on development problems, which after all was what all three of us were doing. It wasn't just that we were doing international work. We were all focusing on developing countries. Hmm. Malcolm had spent several years in Indonesia 
working on Indonesian tax reform, which mm -hmm. really helped Indonesia grow. So we decided to try to set up this master's program. There was considerable skepticism on the part of uh, some of the faculty on the graduate uh, council. Mm -hmm. uh, they thought that maybe this wouldn't last. But in fact, it's going much stronger now than when I left in the year 2000. <laughs> Where were your goals in, in, in setting up that mid-career program? How did that intersect with your own research agendas and your own interests as, as well as mm -hmm. uh, what you thought would be a strong educational program that might help and assist some of these developing countries? Well, at that time, it was pretty clear that uh, most developing countries had really bright people who had not really been trained in how to think comprehensively about policy and the policy process. So that was the unselfish motive. The selfish motive was bringing the experiences of all these people here. I learned more about what was going on in developing countries from the fellows of this PIDP, now MIDP program, uh, than from my own direct research. Uh, also, I went to Philip Griffiths, who was the provost at the time, and slightly coyly asked him whether we could keep the fees that we would be bringing in. Well, fees are really tuitions, and I think at that time it was the only graduate program at Duke where the program kept the tuitions. Mm -hmm. And that's what funded the, uh, the center uh, for many, many years. Other monies came in, but the fact that USAID, the U.S. Agency for International Development, uh, the World Bank, uh, a bunch of foundations, and some governments, including governments of developed countries that were sending some of their uh, people from their foreign assistance agencies, were funding this, really gave us the resources to do lots of things. Uh, it also meant that we were self-financing, and that was absolutely wonderful. Uh, there was a young woman from Thailand who wanted to get a public policy degree. She hadn't really studied much economics before, so this was back around 1995. Uh, I created the Thai Scholar Program which was for her, period. <laughs> but if, if you're running your own show, if you have your own money, then basically you could do something like that. We had other programs. We had some uh, short programs for people from state oil and mining companies, for example. And we were able to run those programs with whatever surplus we had generated from the tuitions from that uh, PIDP program. Uh, that's really what allowed us to take various ventures, most of which were successful. One thing that helped uh, launch the mid-career program was the International Commission for Central American Recovery, um, which was started around 1987, as I believe. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about that, how that came to, to uh, to Duke, you were, I think, the, the project director for, for that, right. uh, and explain how that came about. Okay. Uh, Terry Sanford, who is my hero, approached the Sanford Institute, I think at that time probably Phil Cook was the director, and asked whether the Sanford Institute could be the convener of this commission. Uh, Phil recommended me because I had been doing work in Latin America. And the idea in Senator and Governor Sanford's mind was that we really needed a Marshall Plan for Central America. And the key thing about the Marshall Plan, which I did not understand until talking with uh, Governor Sanford, was that the Marshall Plan, although it was funded by the U.S. government, was actually conceived and designed by the European leaders. And Governor Sanford's idea was that if Central American leaders could come together and try to develop a roadmap 
for not just the recovery, but also the development of Central America. That's the key thing about the title, International Commission for Central American Recovery and Development. Mm. At a time when the civil wars in Central America were winding down, the idea was that if you could put together people from the right and the left, from government, from academia, and so on, that you could pull off something that would be pretty impressive. Uh, Governor Sanford was able to get money from a number of different foundations. He was able to convince Arthur Levitt Jr. to be the co-chair. At that time, Arthur Levitt Jr. was the president of the American Stock Exchange mm -hmm. before the merger. Uh, Sonia Picado, who's a very distinguished Costa Rican, was the co-chair of this. Uh, she was heading a human rights institute there in Costa Rica. And a number of other people. We decided early on that no sitting Central American officials should be on it. Hmm. Why, why was that? Because they would simply have to speak whatever the official line was hmm. of their government. But the people who were involved, many of whom had been in government, uh, there were people on the left, there were people on the right, uh, there were very important Americans, Saul Linowitz, who had a very distinguished diplomatic and guru kind of role, uh, and, and a number of others. We had two Japanese members of this commission. We had Europeans on the commission. And the most astonishing thing is that Terry Sanford was not on the commission. He demanded not to be on the commission <laughs> because of this principle of not having sitting officials, mm. but also because he wanted this to be the Central Americans thing. And they kept on referring to it as the Sanford Commission, and he kept on saying, no, it isn't. <laughs> this is the International Commission for Central American Recovery and Development. We had four major meetings. There was a, uh, a steering committee of members of the commission, and eventually a report came out we also commissioned a number of papers by mainly Central Americans, but a few others, hmm. uh, which came out as another volume, uh, a companion volume to the report, and both were published by Duke University Press. Some of the people on the commission were then elevated, both within government positions and other positions within their countries, and in that respect, we considered this to be quite a success. Uh, the Reagan administration was not at all pleased with this. They thought that this was highly politicized, but that certainly was not the intent. Hmm. Uh, nonetheless, it got a considerable amount of attention, and I think that overall, Governor Sanford's vision of it was actualized. Were a lot of the meetings held here at Duke, or uh, you mentioned there were four meetings, were some of them in Washington, some of them in There was one in Costa Rica, there was one in Stockholm, huh. because we had, uh, Pierre Chory was, uh, I think he actually was with the Swedish Foreign Ministry. It was okay to have people from non-Central American, non-U.S. <laughs> government. So we held a meeting there. We had a meeting in Guatemala City. Uh, there were some events here, but not the big splashy kinds of events. The other wonderful virtue of this was that it put us on the map with the U.S. Agency for International Development, mm -hmm. and they ended up sending us seven Central Americans for this mid-career program. Mm -hmm. And the mid-career program if somebody had some graduate training already, it would be one year, otherwise it would be two years for a master's. Having those seven Central Americans with funding really saved that program because mm -hmm. that was the bolus of money we really needed to get the program off the ground. As that program developed and evolved, it, it did the geography of where you were receiving students change uh, and, and expand? Uh, I, I noticed in some early uh, discussions about the program, there was some concern about having kind of too fractious uh, uh, and too diverse a, a, a body of, of students who might um, come from such different backgrounds, it would be hard to kind of coalesce as a class. But Actually, I found that a virtue. Yeah. 
uh, one of my high points was leading a seminar on energy policy where uh, a Mexican from the Mexican government said that when he got back to Mexico, he thinks it would be a good idea to push for equalizing the price of uh, hydrocarbon fuels across Mexico, gasoline, diesel, and so on. We had a fellow from Nigeria who said, well, you know, we tried that in Nigeria, and it led to uh, cross-state smuggling, uh, economic distortions, and he went on for about 15 minutes and described the problems, and then the Mexican said, bad idea, I don't <laughs> think we'll do that. So the fact that people were from different regions actually was a great virtue. But to respond to your question about changes in, ge in geography, that had a lot to do with trying to get the funding. Mm. So the Muskie program, which was a U.S. government program, enabled us to bring in people from uh, Central Asia, for example, from Mongolia. Mm. Jonathan Abels, who's this incredibly competent executive director, was sent to Mongolia to interview people uh, to see who could come to the program. This was to find people for the Muskie program in a number of different universities. I believe to this day, John cannot abide eating lamb or mutton, having spent time there in uh, Mongolia. But we had some Mongolians hmm. um, who are now quite prominent in the Mongolian government. Hmm. Uh, there were more Latin Americans. We also had a connection with JICA, the Japanese International Cooperation Agency, and with other Japanese institutions. Several of us went there to Tokyo to run some short programs. And so it was, in a sense, catch as catch can, but that really wasn't problematic because one of the principles was that if you look at what's going on in different regions, you may find some strategies that you may not have thought of in your own region. And it doesn't mean you adopt them lock, stock, and barrel, but you do try to think through how you could adapt what was done in other countries uh, to see whether they could work in your particular country. So what do you do about corruption? What do you do about enhancing the role of women in development? Lots of different issues, and there are different approaches in different places. Uh, after hearing a Guatemalan woman lament about the fact that women in Guatemala were not playing a significant role in government, uh, there was uh, a woman from Kenya who said, well, in Kenya, we're the only ones who actually can play a role on environmental issues, so mm. be careful what you wish for. <laughs> Try to make sure that you don't uh, end up being too antagonistic toward the men who are involved in mm. environmental NGOs and so on. So that was just a wonderful experience. You must have learned a lot from having all these students come through the program. Oh, absolutely. At least three of the books that I published were based on the work that I learned about from these PIDP fellows. Uh, Robert Healy, who was at the school, the School of the Environment, now the Nicholas School of the Environment, and I ran a program for two years with fellows from uh, India, one from China, and one from Egypt. Unfortunately, the Egyptian had to go home because his son was ill. Mm. Uh, this was in conjunction with an undergraduate senior seminar that I was running. And we were looking at experiences in dealing with natural resources in developing countries. So Bob and I co-authored a book on that. I did a later book called Why Governments Waste Natural Resources. A lot of the case studies were based on case studies that had been developed by PIDP fellows. Hmm. Uh, I did another one uh, much more recently on what you need to understand about the policy process in developing countries, and a lot of that came from horror stories hmm. learned from fellows in the program on why things didn't work. Hmm. So it was a godsend for me. That was the selfish motive. Mm -hmm. How did the center and the mid-careers program 
interact with the rest of the Sanford Institute and then also the rest of Duke? Were they pretty well integrated into the life and were the students integrated into to the life of Duke and, and Sanford or um, you know, how, did, how did those interplay? Well, I wish they had integrated more. Uh, we encouraged the MPP students who were interested in things international to take the seminars for the mid-career program. Uh, each m member of the graduate program, the PIDP program, would be involved in seminars that were dominated by other PIDP fellows, and the core staff of the center were the teachers, uh, people like Natalia Miravitska, uh, Francis Lethem, who started out in his first year as a PIDP fellow. I knew there was something different going on with him because he had had a, Dinguish, a distinguished career at the World Bank, and after one semester, I said to Francis, okay, let's be serious. Do you want to teach in this program? And he consented to do so. So folks like that would run these seminars, but we encouraged uh, MPP students to participate, and they did a wonderful job as well. Uh, example, uh, Emiliana Vegas, who is now running a major operation at the Inter-American Development Bank, was an MPP, but she sat in on some of these PIDP uh, courses. Uh, Maya Ajmera was an MPP, then founded uh, the Global Fund for Children. She sat in on a lot of these as well. So that was the main integration. Uh, on some occasions, we were able to get other faculty to participate in some of the research programs, but we were mainly tethered to the mid-career program. So uh, people like Vijay Ramachandran, who was hired, who was the deputy director of the center till she went off to DC, uh, she was very active both in, in research and in working with some other people. I think she may have had a joint appointment in the econ department. Hmm. I know that Sudhir did until he went to the World Bank as a young professional. So that was part of the connection. And then the Duke UNC Latin American Studies program was another opportunity. So the Latin American PIDP fellows certainly were enriched by being involved in that program as well. This is a, a heady time in, in terms of uh, global integration during this this moment when you're uh, the, during this period when you're running both the center and the mid careers program. Um, what kind of vantage did, did those uh, did the center and the mid careers program can give you on the tremendous change that was going on in terms of market liberalization in terms of um, the, as the collapse of the Soviet Union takes place. Uh, um, Though, you know, did you end up having a particular vantage on the Washington consensus that you got from um, this program and, and the uh, people that were coming through there? First, I think that it became obvious to everybody in the program that you could not just look at the political aspects of things. Mm. And everybody was trying to grapple with what it meant that the world was being more globalized, that markets were becoming more globalized, that foreign assistance was giving way actually to private investment in terms of what was important for developing countries. That was a major wake-up call. Uh, the idea that the so-called Washington Consensus was not this evil thing that would lead uh, the first world to dominate the third world but that developing countries really needed to increase their capacity to be involved in negotiating with corporations, with first world countries and the like. A lot of the work at the center involved how to deal with natural resources because many developing countries had them and it turns out that how these natural resources were managed, whether the governments were able to capture the rents, after all, the, the value of the natural resources is owned by the country. Uh, the United States is an exception that 
in the United States, subsoil assets are owned whoever, by whoever owns the land. This is not true in the bulk of countries. And so how a government would deal with uh, an international oil company or international mining company was crucial. And the countries that were successful in this would grow. Other countries would suffer from the so-called resource curse. Mm. So there was a lot of discussion on that. But there were also lots of discussions on how governments should deal with foreign investment in general, which became a much bigger player than it had been before. Uh, so that was certainly one aspect of liberalization. Another really important thing was that a lot of countries were going through these huge debt crises, mm -hmm. especially around 1980, and just trying to figure out how to deal with that later on when the PIDP fellows were trying to grapple with what happened in that decade. Uh, in Latin America, the decade of the 1980s was called the lost decade. It was a disaster for many Latin American countries. And then the question was, how do you avoid that kind of problem in the future? Uh, do you need to increase your tax revenues? Well, that's where Malcolm Gillis and Robert Conrad, Conrad also having a joint appointment with economics, but in the Sanford Institute, were the real gurus on this. Uh, Bob Conrad has been a major advisor uh, to a number of international organizations, as well as to the U.S. Treasury Department. So many of the students in the program were trying to understand what the tax structure should look like. They were trying to understand how a government can create some policies that actually could balance their economy going forward. Looking at cases like Chile that has a stabilization fund so that when the price of copper is sky high, they don't squander it all then. Uh, instead, they could save for a rainy day. So. The fact that the world was becoming much more open was certainly something that every country had to grapple with, but particularly the developing countries because they are so much more vulnerable to world fluctuations. So in 1994, you take on a role as director of the Sanford Institute. How, how did you make that choice and did you feel like, um, did you have to leave the center and the mid-careers program in, in someone else's hands while you kind of took that role or did you keep a pretty equal eye on, on that while that was going on? I think I did it because it was my turn. Hmm. Uh, I didn't have any uh, great aspirations to rise up. Uh, Phil Cook, Bruce Conahome had done a terrific job. And so I thought that it was timely to do that. The Sanford Institute was already very well established. The main goal I had was that it would make a lot of sense for us to graduate to become a school. So that was my agenda. I tried various things. One thing I tried was to see whether we could find some common themes among all of the faculty to work on. A lot of places were doing this. And the response I got from my colleagues was that they already had their very important research priorities. Hmm. Remember a, a meeting with Charlie Klotfelter who said, Bill, we really like you, but we're all doing what we think we should be doing. So thanks for making these suggestions, <laughs> but um, we'll continue to do what we're doing. And after all, we did have a number of different centers. Hmm. So that initiative didn't need to push. Mm -hmm. But I did try to get people interested in becoming a school. Uh, I think that there was actually quite a bit of opposition on the part of uh, Duke administration on it, partly because it's a scary thing. I probably did not fully realize that in the mind of Nan Cohane, the idea was if you want to have a school, it has to be a mega fundraising opportunity. Hmm. And I just wanted to slide something in. We had the resources to do it. It would have been helpful. 
And the most important thing is that we were very entrepreneurial. I don't mean myself, but all of the core faculty in going out and snagging distinguished chairs. Mm. We would convince somebody to give money to the Sanford Institute for a chair or for various programs. And then when we put in requests for renewals when people would leave, these requests were denied by Arts and Sciences uh, because they felt we already had enough faculty. In other words, we were subsidizing Arts and Sciences through our efforts to fundraise, mm. and that did not seem very comfortable. Mm. Plus, there was always a risk when we generated one surplus or another that because we're part of Arts and Sciences that somehow uh, our funds would be raided. Mm. So there was a structural issue about being a unit within arts and sciences that was not sitting comfortably. Uh, but when I was the director, that really didn't move. Mm. On the other hand, there was some expansion. And I left this to uh, my much more competent colleagues to try to do the politics of mm. that. So I was very pleased when the school was founded. Mm -hmm. But during those years, basically, we were just trying to improve our programs. Mm -hmm. You had just moved into the new building uh, from the old old Kim um, site. Um, uh, that must have been a, an upgrade uh, in terms of a lot of the programs that you were interested in and, and running. Did that Was that helpful for both the center and the mid-careers program to move into that new space? Uh, it, it was very helpful. It, the building was less contaminated huh. than the old Kim building. Uh, Actually, we moved into the building while there was still rubble all over the place. Mm. Uh, there were some delays in the building. Fortunately, somebody in the Duke construction arm had a friend in the city of Durham government, so we were able to get an occupancy permit before we should have received the occupancy permit. Uh, but it was great to be in the building. I think the building gave us more symbolic standing that this was a different entity. Uh, certainly we were able to set up a small library for uh, the center. We were able to hold seminars in more comfortable areas. Uh, we didn't have to beg and steal to get space. Mm. So that, that was certainly a big plus. Did the space itself facilitate growth in terms of the numbers of people in the program? or You know, we never had a problem with the space mm. for the program. Uh, the program at that time was considerably smaller than it is now. And so the seminar rooms in the building were fine. The building was brilliantly designed such that you have to come into contact with a lot of people. Mm. And in that commons area on the lower level, you could see other faculty. You could see students from different programs within the institute. Uh, the loges on different levels would also allow you to mingle with people. It was one of the best design buildings I've ever seen. And certainly within the Sanford Institute, there's always been a lot of camaraderie, a lot of interaction among the faculty and, and the students. So uh, I think it was great to be in the new building that actually was designed explicitly to give us that kind of interaction. Now with the, the effort to take Sanford from an institute to a school, I understand that um, uh, one of the impetuses was to try to increase the competitiveness of the MPP program. Um, because it was, as you were pointing out, losing resources and helping to fund the rest of the arts and sciences graduate programs. Uh, but it was hard for you all to keep up the, um, uh, the faculty that would kind of maintain uh, the teaching ratios that you wanted to maintain and um, otherwise help with the sort of fellowship packages that you needed to be able to provide to be competitive right. with the Kennedy School and, and other places. Um, right. So was, was that, was, am I correct that that was part of the, the interest? 
I think it was mainly to expand the faculty. Mm -hmm. Because of the commitment to teaching well, and I did not establish this, it had been established before I got to Duke, uh, there was a great desire to keep the class size down. Well, if you have X number of faculty and you don't want huge classes, you cannot expand the number of students coming into the program. For a number of years, I was on the master's uh, admissions committee. And there are certainly constraints in terms of how many we could take in. So the idea of expanding it and the idea of expanding to a PhD program, which was in the air pretty early on, those were always felt to be constraints in the constrained by the amount of financial resources and visibility that we had. So all over the country you were getting the schools of public policy. Not only the Kennedy School, but uh, the Johnson School at the University of Texas, Hubert Humphrey School at Minnesota, uh, Berkeley has a public policy school, USC had a long-standing school of development and policy and we were an institute with a Department of Public Policy Studies. I don't want to see buried within arts and sciences, but presumably that would be the impression people would get. So being able to be a school, to be able to capture the resources uh, was a clear mandate. But it would take a while, and it was finally pulled off. In your final years, it's, so you were there. You were as director of, of the Sanford from 1994 to 1997. But I understand that in 1997 and maybe even in 1996, you were interested in becoming involved in this effort that Duke was making to partner with a new institution in Thailand. Right. Um, what, what was that? What was going on there, and, and what ended up happening with with that? So I've been working with uh, a group of uh, Thai leaders who were in business, government, and academia. And they were very disappointed with how universities were operating in Thailand. Uh, they were, which is typical in both East Asia and Latin America, very narrow, uh, very professional oriented. You would immediately go into a law faculty or a, you'd go into medicine as an undergraduate. And uh, people were being trained in a very narrow way. They wanted an American-style university. They wanted it not in Bangkok, but not very far from Bangkok. They wanted to appeal not only to Thai students, but to students from other East Asian countries. And so uh, they asked me to consult with them in what a university would look like. So with my collaborator and dear friend Gary Brewer at Yale, we decided that this would be really difficult to do, so we would present them with an outrageous proposal, which was to have a university with no departments. It would have a number of institutes that were very problem-oriented. Uh, Gary Brewer is more of a policy scientist than I am, and this is the problem orientation. You structure a university around various problems, like cultural sustainability, regional development, and mm -hmm. so on. We proposed this, and these Thai leaders ate it up. They thought this was the greatest thing because it would break Thailand out of that mold of being very narrow, like you only study economics, you only study dentistry, you only study law. So we proposed this around 1994. And they said, fine, develop the university. Hmm. So Gary and I made maybe four trips to Thailand. And we knew we needed to get uh, some US university to provide a little gravitas to this. We ended up negotiating with Duke. And Duke agreed that it would help out with this in some yet to be determined way once the university got off the ground. Hmm. We got a commitment from uh, a real estate tycoon in Thailand 
to have some property that he owned, which was close by a golf course, which is a little bit too far from Bangkok to have enough customers. So this would help develop that area. <laughs> and I had no problem with the fact that uh, he could do well by doing good. We brought in Jay Flood, who's a very distinguished architect, to try to start to do the planning of it. We had a curriculum set up. We had a financial model. And then 1997 happened, which was the East Asian economic meltdown, and mm -hmm. all bets were off. Uh, my wife and I were actually studying Thai. It looked like we'd be spending five years there. Our children were very thankful that we were not going to Thailand. But it was a great experience, mm -hmm. and we've maintained quite a number of connections with Thailand. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, Vijarama Chandran and Dennis Rondinelli, who ended up at uh, the Duke Center for International Development for a while, we made several trips to Thailand to do some training programs for people there. Mm -hmm. So that, that has been a very important connection. Uh, but that in, from that initiative, I learned a lot. Do not be dependent on the world economy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Duke was supportive enough to say that they would uh, be some sort of partner in that. That's correct, you know, yes. It's almost a precursor, it sounds like, to some of the uh, things that are going on now with, say, Duke Kunshan and... and um, Absolutely, yeah. But it's important to note that this would not be giving a Duke degree. Uh, Duke would be a collaborator in this, and the Duke folks were very careful to make sure that there was no reputational risk. Mm. And I think this is the big problem that a lot of universities face. Uh, for example, when the Singaporeans came to the Claremont Colleges to form a, uh, a collaboration of uh, another Claremont College in Singapore, mm. Uh, the Claremont College decided not to do this because of the reputational risk. Singapore is a police state. Uh, homosexuality is illegal in Singapore. And so we said no, there would be too much risk. Uh, so they went to Yale and Yale agreed. But that's another story. <laughs> um, well, so in 2000, you, uh, you decided to leave uh, Duke and the Sanford, uh, Sanford Institute at that time. Um, what, what led to that decision? And, um, did you feel like you were at risk by leaving some of these babies that you had created uh, uh, in other people's hands? Well, in terms of motivation, uh, as much as Durham has improved, we knew that none of our three kids would return to Durham. Mm -hmm. At that time, they were all living uh, further north, one in D.C., two in the Princeton area. Uh, we thought we'd have a shot if we moved to the L.A. area. Now they all live in the L.A. area, mm -hmm. so that was a miracle. That was one thing, but I had no worries whatsoever about leaving uh, Sight or now Decid. Mm -hmm. The name changed almost immediately when I left. <laughs> uh, but that was fine because Jonathan Abels is the most able administrator I've ever met. And Natalia Mirovitska is enormously effective. Francis Lethem, Corey Krupp. These, were, these people were so competent and so committed that I really didn't worry about it. Uh, and there's nothing better than to set up something and then leave it knowing it's in good hands and that it'll do even better. So I've been back a few times. My wife and I did some lectures here a few years ago. And it was really gratifying to see how much it had expanded and improved, including through the Rotary program, mm. which I had been involved in the negotiations and writing up the proposals. And the Duke UNC Rotary program has prospered, even though some of the other Rotary programs, this is the new Rotary International Peace Program, mm. some of them collapsed. But the one here has been a, a great success. And that was another thing that reinforced the center because it was yet another pot of money 
when these refugees from the Harvard Institute for International Development came in, that first-rate public finance group also helped uh, as a bulwark for the center's finances. So I really was not at all worried about uh, that problem. I was a little bit concerned about whether my get out of jail free letter from the provost that said we could keep our money, whether that might be changed, mm. but it wasn't. Mm. So knowing that it hadn't been changed uh, allowed me to leave without any qualms about that. Mm. Going back to the Sanford Commission, um, I wanted to get a, a better sense about what some of the outcomes were from that uh, and, and what kind of impacts that you saw that that had, uh, particularly when it came to international development in, in Central America? Well, I'd say there were three impacts. Uh, one was that some of the participants did get more prominent positions, both within the governments of Central America and in other important institutions. For example, Sonia Picado became even more prominent than she had been and I think played a role in the Costa Rican government. Second, uh, some of the plan actually was instituted in some of the Central American governments. It was, it was a blueprint, just as the Marshall Plan was a blueprint. And we were getting reports informally that uh, some of these recommendations were being adopted on things like how to improve the education systems in the country, how to press for more democratization within the countries that had come out of these civil wars. So that was quite gratifying to hear that. Uh, but also within the U.S. government after the Reagan years, uh, some of the recommendations of the report were adopted uh, obviously with some modification depending on the politics of the moment. But I think it put uh, the Central American issues on the map more within the thinking of U.S. government officials uh, that ended up making uh, a difference. Now, of course, it's impossible to try to figure out how much any given piece of intelligence, to use the broad term, is going to have on the policy process. And that's one of the frustrations of people who do research on these things. You sort of drop your, your research and the reports into the pot, and you never know how much of that is really going to make a difference. Hmm. But informally, we were told that it, it did make a difference, both in terms of U.S. awareness and some of the U.S. policies. I think it also made a difference in terms of the orientation of other governments, like the Swedish government. Hmm. Pierre Chory, uh, who was in the foreign ministry of Sweden, was adamant that the report have more about the environment than we originally had conceived. And it was in the report, and the Swedish government has been pressing for Central American governments to do more about environmental issues. So I think that was all to the good as well in terms of uh, the impact of the report. So I was hoping you could speak a little bit more to the name change right after you left. It's almost as if they were just dying to change the name. Um, <laughs> uh, and the word research gets dropped from uh, the original formulation as uh, uh, the Center for International Development Research into the Duke Center for International Development. And I, I wondered if you thought the dropping of that name, research, kind of signified anything uh, uh, concrete about the reshaping of the direction of, of the center. I don't think so. And I've joked with uh, some of the people who are still involved in the program about it. Were they just dying till I left so that they could make that and other changes? I think basically the idea was that this was a much more open-ended kind of title for it. First of all, it had Duke in it. Mm. The Center for International Development Research doesn't say Duke. Mm. This says the Duke Center for International Development. So I certainly would not have opposed the change. 
Originally, we called it the Center for International Development Research to try to give it a little gravitas when it didn't deserve any. Uh, but since there has been research, there is consulting, there is teaching, uh, there were various other initiatives that this was the broadest possible title. And I think it makes tons of sense. Uh, I had no resentment about the fact that the title was changed. I just found it quite amusing that it happened almost <laughs> immediately after I left. They could have asked me about it before I would have said that would be fine. But it's, it's not the first time that as the director, uh, the other people in the program thought better of some of my ideas. Uh, I remember having a wonderful retreat where I was saying, well, we just had one of our workshops on state oil and mining companies, and I thought that this was quite impressive, although we didn't have enough uh, participants in it. And they said, oh, it was such a pain in the neck for them, the resources that went into it. Do we really have to do this again? And I said, oh, thanks for telling me. No, we don't. <laughs> so uh, I think one of the hallmarks of the way this worked was that we actually had a lot of free-for-all interactions uh, among the administrative staff, the faculty, and myself. And that's, it felt more like a family uh, than any kind of hierarchy. And that was really neat. You mentioned that Terry Sanford was your hero. Terry Sanford was the governor of North Carolina and then uh, for a long time the president of Duke University and then finally moved on to the Senate. Uh, why was he your hero? Why did, why did you consider him um, such an important mm -hmm. figure? Oh, so many different aspects. Uh, for one thing, when I learned that Senator, Governor, I guess I'll call him Governor now, when he was Governor, he sent his kids to integrate a school. That was a very gutsy move for him to do because, as you know better than I, in North Carolina, there's always been this Democrat-Republican balance and I could have imagined that he would risk losing a lot of votes or that his political career would have been jeopardized by taking an action like that. So that was one thing that I learned. Second, as president, he was willing to take all sorts of risks, including setting up the Sanford Institute over the kicking and screaming of various other people in various departments. I remember back roughly in 1998, sitting with somebody from the econ department, I don't remember the fellow's name, and he said to me, when the Sanford Institute had been set up, he was in opposition of it. Hmm. And now he thinks that he was wrong. Hmm. Well, thanks, <laughs> after all those years. But the fact that Sanford always felt that this university needed to try many different things. And I think later on, that became more difficult under other presidents when there was more of this idea of reputational risk. Hmm. And then what really cemented it for me was the fact that he did not want it called the Sanford uh, Commission, that he really wanted to stay back. And you could see this even physically when we held meetings of the commission, we, we would sit at a table. Governor Sanford would sit not at the table, but he would sit in one of the back rows. Hmm. Now, everybody knew he was there, but still, he was not putting himself forward. And, and that's what a statesman hmm. is like. He didn't need to be the center of attention uh, in this. Well, so that is being high in rectitude. Uh, he was, had tremendous affection among the students. He was teaching a course after he got defeated in uh, the senatorial election because he had a heart valve replacement. People thought he was not robust enough, which was not the case. So he lost the election. He 
came onto the faculty. I was the director at the time. And he tried to treat me as the director. But, of course, he was governor, <laughs> senator, president, Sanford. But he was a true gentleman about that. He taught a course on state and local policy. Now, in most public policy programs, that is the least interesting thing for students. International things are sexy, national things are exciting, state and local, no. His course was beloved because at the beginning of his course he would say, here in the United States we have at the state level 50 natural experiments of things that are going on. Things like the North Carolina School of Science and Math, which he also innovated as governor, then replicated in other states. That we have all these natural experiments going on that states can learn from one another. Same deal at the county levels and at the local levels. So he got students so excited about the fact that looking at the state and local levels meant that you saw all of these policy experiments and that you could learn so much from them. It also helped that he would invite the students over to, the, to his home and invite them to pig pickings and things of that sort. So he was as warm a person as you could ever imagine. Governor Sanford can never cross a room without zigzagging to <laughs> shake hands with people. He was, he was not just a naturally born politician, he was a naturally born, warm human being. And to put all those things together while at the same time being so powerful. I remember being at one meeting with him where someone made a suggestion and with hand motions he said, no, that won't work. And he would explain why. And he just cut off this nutty idea very definitively. And it was a nutty idea. I won't say who suggested it. It wasn't me. <laughs> but he was, he was able to be definitive, but never insulting to people. And that was extremely impressive. When you look at what uh, the Duke Center for International Development is now versus what, it was, what you envisioned in 1985 when you and Malcolm Gillis set it up, uh, what, what do you see? What, what stands out in that, in that difference? I certainly would not have anticipated that this MIDP program would become so large and so prominent. If I'm not mistaken, there's something like 500 alumni around the world. I'm going to the Policy Sciences Annual Institute meeting tomorrow at the World Bank, and I think there are probably eight to 10 World Bank officials who had been in the program. Uh, there are people in other international organizations. There are people in governments around the world, both in developing countries but also in developed countries. So I think if you would ask me, is that in the cards back in 1985, I would say I would have no idea whether that would be possible, but it is. I would say the consulting arm is very impressive. Hmm. Uh, I would say that the linkages both within Duke and to UNC are quite impressive as well. So I think the expansion on so many different dimensions is something that would have been very hard to predict. But clearly we thought from the beginning that it would involve some interaction between research and training. And the two really do need to dovetail. Uh, I think that having been back here a few years ago and talking to some of the Sanford faculty, that the whole Sanford faculty is much more internationalized than it was before. Uh, people like Suprindu, um, that really helps. And the degree of interaction that those people have with the center is 
I think a matter of what their research is like and how much they could find common cause in research projects. But that's something that really has been kept flexible. And I don't know whether it is at the levels that are optimal or, or not, because I haven't been paying that much attention to it since I have my own fish to fry. <laughs> is there anything else that I haven't asked you that you um, would like to take this opportunity to, to tell us, um, particularly in thinking about your legacy here at Duke? Well, I would like to point out that another major project we did, which was actually Natalia's baby, was a quite prominent conference on environmental security in the Caspian Sea. Mm -hmm. Natalia was able to get funding from NATO for this. It involved uh, both officials and NGO activists and academics from the literal countries of the Caspian Sea, which before the project started I could not have named. Uh, it involved people from other countries, including Armenia. It involved some of the PIDP fellows. Mm. Kostya Atanasian, who is now at the World Bank in the uh, Independent Evaluation Group, was a participant in this. He had been speaker for the Armenian prime minister before entering the PIDP program. He was involved in this. Uh, there were people from Scotland involved. I mean, it was, it was a big deal. It was held in Venice. A quite prominent report came out of this. And that kind of project really dovetailed with the PIDP because that enabled us to set our net more widely mm -hmm. and to bring in people who never would have heard of the, the center. So it, it, that was one of the hallmark efforts. Uh, the short-term programs we were running on various topics also expanded our visibility to the point where today people know of the program. And that was iffy from the very beginning. Again, it's a matter of real gratification. Well, thank you, Professor Asher, for your time. My it was pleasure. a pleasure to speak to you. My pleasure. Thank you.